Wow, what a way to start a gloomy Sunday morning in Greenville, South Carolina, huh? My friends, greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and welcome to this gathering for worship here in Greenville, South Carolina. If you are visiting with us here in the sanctuary or live streaming from somewhere around the world, we are so delighted that you have joined your hearts and minds together in ours in praise of the one who was, who is, and shall ever be the same. Before our hymn of praise this morning and our call to worship from Psalm 105, our children's choir are going to share a special selection with us. I invite you to stand together with our children. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice.
Please join me in prayer. Lord of the years, everything within us adores you. You are the author of life and of all creation. And so we sing your amen for all to hear. Thank you for your presence here among us. Instruct us this morning by your word and by your Holy Spirit that we would go from this place equipped and willing to be your light and love in this community and around the world. Fill us with your wisdom. Give us joy for the journey. Bring rest to our souls that we would be renewed for a life of discipleship and of living with you. And we ask this in and through Christ our Lord. Amen. Once again, good morning and welcome to this gathering for worship here at First Presbyterian Church where we are equipping ourselves to transform the heart of our city and beyond with the good news of the gospel of Jesus. We're so pleased that you would join your hearts and minds together with ours so that we may be instructed from God's word once again for the living of each day. As is often the case, we have just a few announcements we'd like to highlight for you. So if you would, turn to the back side of the worship folder that was given to you this morning. This is where all of our announcements are listed, and I'll walk us through just a few of these. Of course, you'll see there at the top, if you are visiting with us today, once again, a very special welcome to you. We're th so thankful for your presence here with us. And we've created a way that you can connect with us a little, a little further. You can either text on your phone the number you see on the video screens or the number you see there, the word connect, or you can go to our website and find the connect, connect tab. Indicate just a little information there for us, and that will allow us to begin sending you uh, information. We promise, however, we will not fill up your junk mail folder, okay? It'll be just enough for you to remain abreast of all the things that are going on here. You'll see the announcement that the Learning to Rest in God Seminar is going to be led by Dr. Mark Pattison. He is the president of our Denomish Nation's Flourish Institute of Theology. If you would, please note the Registration information there, there's a fee for the course, but it will be uh, quite well worth it. Our Discover First New Member Weekend is also coming up on May 3rd through 4th. Uh, some of you may or may not know that our last uh, New Member Weekend had to be capped at 100 people. We hired Dennis The Rock Johnson to be a bouncer at the door. So... In order to, and we already have, from what I understand, over 60 people registered for this coming class. So in order to avoid Dennis the Rock or any other bouncer that we might have to hire, just kidding, uh, please uh, go ahead and register for that. We would love to enjoy your presence there with us. Immediately after the worship service today, here in the sanctuary and in the worship and art center, there'll be a congregational meeting for the purpose of hearing a report from our associate pastor nominating committee and voting on their recommendation for a new congregational care pastor. For those of you who are covenant partners here, we would ask that you would please stay uh, for this brief meeting. If you're a visitor here, you are welcome to observe and see how we do things. We'd love to have you as well. I'm sad to announce that Tom Brissy has passed away this week. There is a funeral plan for him here this Thursday. Also, Jack DePriester and Melanie Tennelly uh, came to see their Savior face to face as Lord, uh, their Lord as well this week. The funeral arrangements for those two have not yet been finalized. I think that concludes all the highlights I'd like to highlight for you. Please do take a moment, either later today or at some moment, to go through all the announcements there that, so you can remain abreast of all the many activities going on here. We have a moment for a mission uh, to offer you, and as Sarah Reiser comes forward to share that with you, I'm going to ask that you would turn your attentions to the video screen for a video.
I am just amazed by all of the things that happened here in a year since we've built the new part of our building, and that isn't even all of it. And we're only just getting started. And so I just wanted to come in today. Um, I've had the pleasure of serving on the first campaign, and we thought we were going to be able to raise hopefully $15 million in the first campaign. And then God showed us that we could do so much more. We raised over $20 million. And now we're on the second campaign, and as you can see on the board, we are up to $6.8 million, just short of $7 million. So we're almost halfway there, and I'm here today to ask you to please join us. Um, if you're visiting today, you are welcome. We created this space to be a big front door welcome on West Washington Street to welcome people in to the events and activities of this church so they could be transformed and know the love of Jesus Christ. So everyone received a pledge card today as they came in. If you've given already, thank you so much. Your gift means you know, a much, so much to us. And um, if you haven't given yet, which I think a lot of people, maybe they've just been kind of seeing what they can do for the second campaign, now's the time. We need your gift more than ever. And, you know, when we were reading the book of John, we see Jesus say to his disciples, we need to feed the 5,000. And, you know, Philip says, that's impossible. That would be eight months wages. And so maybe you're looking at this last bit and you're thinking, this is kind of an impossible amount you're asking us to raise here. And the truth is, is that God can do the impossible, even with the smallest amount. Andrew said, here's a little lunch you can use to feed these people, and it fed everyone. So even if you think what you have is just a little bit, we need your help. We would love everyone to join us in this campaign today. Thank you. In a Sunday school class this morning, I, was, I listened to Jeff Messer make a presentation on our strategic plan talking about the things that we felt God was calling us to do back in 2016. And certainly one of those things was to uh, renovate and frankly bulldoze and create a new building. And so many uh, aspects of that 2016 plan have been completed. We've built that building. We've accomplished a number of other things. And now just to let you know, coinciding with the capital campaign, we're in a strategic planning season as well. We really want to seek God's heart and mind for how we're going to continue to leverage these things that he has given us. So I do encourage you to continue to be a part of the capital campaign. Much fruit is being borne by your giving, my friends. And keep that in mind as well today as we bring our offering as a part of our worship service. For us, giving is an aspect of worship. It's who we are as disciples, as followers of Jesus. Keep this in mind as you bring your gifts and tithes now into the house of the Lord.
when Pastor Richard comes in just a short while to share with us from God's Word, he'll be starting a message series that's going to focus on the Holy Spirit's work in and among us. In preparation for that, I want to lead us in a pastoral prayer, which focuses on the Holy Spirit's movement in our lives. At the conclusion of our prayer time, I'll ask you to join together with me in response from the words from Psalm 105, which will be provided for us. Let's pray. Father, with great joy in our hearts, we give you thanks for the gift of your Holy Spirit, for the way that your Spirit renews us, recreates us, and ignites a passion within us to live for you and to search your word for truth. We also give you thanks, O oh God, for reopening the way of communication between you and us so that we might share the deepest desires of our hearts with you as indeed you have shared the deepest desire of your heart with us. And so, God, we intercede on behalf of those who do not know you or who have grown distant from your love. Listen now, Lord, as we silently lift their names to you in prayer, asking that you would send your regenerating, renewing Holy Spirit into their hearts and minds. For those who know you, but do not know how to pray because they are in the deep throes of depression or grief. Give them comfort, great God, and deliver them from their pain. Listen now as we silently lift up to you the names of those we know who are hurting in some way, either physically, emotionally, or spiritually. And as we ask you to bring your spirit's healing touch upon their lives. We ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would heal the communication gap between husband and wife, mother and daughter, father and son, Palestinian, Iranian, and Jew. Give understanding and patience, Father, that rage and resentment would not be the spirit of the age, but that your peace would come and there would be healing in the land. We ask all of these things and much more, dear Father, in Jesus' name. And praying in response to the ancient words of Psalm 105, saying this, Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. O oh, descendants of Abraham, his servant. O oh, sons of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. Amen. We invite you to stand with us and let us sing our hymn of preparation now. Come, people of the blessed King.
Please turn with me in your Bible this morning to the New Testament book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, as we read verses 1 through 13 this morning, and you'll find it on page 1692 of the church Bible. For those watching at home this morning, whenever we open up our scriptures here or pause in prayer, please feel free to do the same at home. And especially as we come to God's Word, it would be good to have a Bible open on your lap and follow along with us. So, Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked each other, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Amen, and we trust that God will bless to us. There's reading from His holy word. I suspect most of us have fond memories as children of doing puzzles. And one of my fondest memories was going to visit grandmother or an aunt or an uncle and being able to complete what we call back then a dot-to-dot -dot puzzle. And I suspect you know what I mean, that you would be given as a child a sheet with dots and numbers and a little bit of an image or a picture there. And you would start at number one and you'd make your way to number two, then three, then four. And if you got to five, and then in quick succession, you had a six, seven, eight, nine. Well, that was very exciting. And so you copied all that in. And then eventually, the further you got round and the more complex it was, the better better because here was a picture beginning to emerge and gradually you understood what the image was. And then, of course, as you got from age five into six and seven and eight, you discovered that a grandparent or a parent would give you some coloring in pencils or crayons. And then not only could you draw the image, you could then shade it in. And when you learn to color between the lines or inside the lines, well, that was very exciting. And I remember age seven being given for the first time a series of felt markers just for me, all sorts of colors, and boy, did I have fun coloring in and playing with them. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, for this reason, that over the next few Sundays, we're coming, as Brian mentioned earlier, to look at a series of studies on the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? Why did He come at Pentecost? What does He do in our lives? And how do we then relate to the Holy Spirit of God? And so that's where we'll be. And I'm hopeful and prayerful that during this series, we'll be able to join some dots in our minds and souls that we hadn't quite seen before. And so that's my hope. Because over these Sundays, we'll be looking at things like encountering the Holy Spirit, discovering and developing the gifts of the Holy Spirit, keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. We'll also be looking at what does it mean to nurture a life in the Holy Spirit. In other words, being conscious of Him and sensitive towards Him. 
We'll also be looking at learning to rest in the Holy Spirit as you seek His leading and guiding and directing in your life. And finally, what does it mean being led by the Holy Spirit? So all of this is coming over these next seven or eight Sundays together. And one of the fascinating studies for looking at the Holy Spirit is to compare what happened in the Old Testament and what happens in the New. And very briefly, in summary form, the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament would anoint an individual like David for a season, the period of his kingship, or anoint Samuel, for example, as a priest to the people of Israel for all his life. But when it comes to the New Testament, the difference is this. Not only will he anoint and walk beside and lead and guide, but in the New Testament, he comes to indwell us. And there is a significant difference between the old and the new. So much so, in fact, that in the books of Ezekiel and Joel, they prophesy and anticipate the coming of the Holy Spirit and the power that will come with Him to transform and renew lives. And in fact, the night before Jesus died in the upper room at what we call the Last Supper, He said these words, It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Counselor, in other words, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now, put yourself in the position of the apostles. And when Jesus says to them, it is for your good I am going away, I imagine them thinking, wait a minute, how could it possibly be for our good that you are leaving us? Jesus, don't you remember that over the last three years, when we were first introduced to you, when we first got to know you, and our hearts and minds and souls were changed forever? Jesus, don't you remember one miracle after another, after another, after another? Don't you remember the impact of your teaching and the lives that were changed? Jesus, don't you remember those long walks between cities and towns when we were with you and you would talk to us? Don't you remember sitting up late at night around a campfire when we were having our supper and you would take us to profound levels of conversation, talking about the intimacy with your Father? It is good that you are going away. Jesus, how is this remotely possible? And Jesus explains, the Holy Spirit will come. And what was he meaning there? Simply this. Because Jesus was fully God, but also fully man, he inhabited a physical body. After his resurrection, he had a supernatural body, but that supernatural body had restrictions placed on it. But there's no restrictions for the Holy Spirit in terms of where he can be and when and why. He can be in Guatemala in all of his fullness and also in Greenville at the same time or Glasgow, or Ukraine, or Indonesia, or Hong Kong. And so, when Jesus said, it is good for you that I go away so the Holy Spirit can come, He's saying the Holy Spirit will come and indwell people right across the world. That's the point He's making. So, having said all of that by way of introduction, the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. And what we're about to read is an unprecedented turning point, not simply in the life of Christianity, but I would argue in the life of all of history and in all time, and, and also an unprecedented turning point in the world as well. So, let's look at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled. Now, let me break that down and explain what's going on here. The mighty wind was symbolic of the power of the Holy Spirit. The tongues of fire, symbolic of the cleansing and purity that comes 
with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And of course, Scripture teaches us, us, and we know in our own experience as well, that when we seek to live out our faith, when we seek to be obedient to the call of God, purity, holiness matters. In other words, our walk must equal our talk. We can't simply say, yes, we have genuine faith and live any old life we want. It must match up. And so we see it symbolically represented here in the tongues of fire. And then finally, the ability to speak in foreign languages, which was incredibly strange, symbolic of the impact the Holy Spirit would have around the world. Because up to this point, God had, in many ways, been simply focused on the people of Israel. But after Calvary, after the resurrection, with the coming of the Holy Spirit, suddenly the gospel was for all people in all places of every tribe and tongue and language, and the gospel spread across the world. So all of that is wrapped up in the coming of the Holy Spirit. But the other thing that's worth noticing is this at verse 4, because we tend to focus on the outward manifestation of the Spirit, but in verse 4 we read, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Not just the apostles, not just Peter, James, John, Andrew, Thomas, and the others. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And from that point on, every individual, if I can use modern terminology, who came to a point of faith, who entered into a relationship with Christ, came to that point of commitment in the following manner, that the Holy Spirit would reach out and draw that individual to himself through the gospel. And as individuals suddenly began to realize and appreciate the immensity of the love and grace of God, to submit to his rule and reign in their lives, to ask him to forgive them and cleanse them and change them, and to ask him if he, they could follow him all their days. Not only does he draw them to them, not only does he cleanse them, but then the Holy Spirit spiritually enters into them and dwells within them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what's going on right here. And so that sense of moving away from religious observance to a personal relationship. That's what's happening, and that's why we celebrate Pentecost, because at that point, no longer was the cross simply, well, let me put it another way, no longer did they only have an intellectual or emotional awareness of what happened at Calvary. They understood on a personal basis, because now they were in a relationship with God Himself. And the beauty and wonder of it all, and please hear this, we've said it several times in the past, but it's been a while since I've emphasized it, and please remember, it is the same moral and supernatural power that brought Christ back from the dead now lives in us because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Because God, having called you into a relationship, never leaves you to work it out in your own strength. He doesn't simply wind us up, put us down, and say, go for it, while He stands back. It's the opposite. He gives to us His Holy Spirit. He indwells us. He empowers us. He strengthens us and enables us to persevere. And He gives us patience and kindness and love and grace, the fruits of the Spirit, and we'll come to that in subsequent weeks. So, all of that is wrapped up in this remarkable passage of the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Now, you may be saying, okay, Richard, I think I hear what you're saying. I think I've grasped it. And in some ways, in subsequent, previous Sundays rather, you've touched on some of this, and we have. But you may also be saying, Richard, hold on a second. There seems to me to be more going on here than simply God drawing, inviting, and bringing people into a personal relationship with Him. Because if I read this correctly, Richard, I also read here the birth of the infant church. 
which had never happened before. And you're absolutely right. And the question then becomes, if Pentecost was the birth of the church in the first century, what does it mean to be actively conscious and following and living out our faith in the power of the Holy Spirit in the 21st century? One thing to look at the first century, historically interesting, fascinating detail, but what does it mean to live out your faith today? Well, let me try and be as practical as I can. Over the last seven or eight years, and many of you have been with us through this journey, in fact, I would say probably at least two-thirds of us, seven, eight years ago, we began a new process of a new strategic plan looking at the next 10 years. And during that strategic plan, we spent a lot of time praying, preparing, wondering where God was taking us, actively, consciously thinking about the next 10 years. Who are we? Who do we want to become? And what we said back then when we started was that we wanted to be a people whose dreams are greater than our memories. Because as Presbyterians, we love the past. We love a sense of history. We love to look back and see how wonderful and great the old days were. But we've also been called by God to live in a 21st century context. So what kind of people do we want to be as we live out our faith today? And the first was this, a people whose dreams were greater than our memories. We wanted to have a vision that would excite us and unite us and encourage us to be the people God is calling us to be. Secondly, we said that we want to be a people who have a sense of belonging. In other words, when I pass children and youths in the corridors, sometimes I'll give them a high five, a fist bump, we'll hang out together. I spent about 15 minutes this morning with four or five teenagers and had a rare old time just chatting and catching up with them. In fact, they were telling me their best jokes, and it was highly entertaining. But they had a sense of belonging. This is their church. They're allowed to wander the corridors. They're allowed to be here on Wednesday evenings. They're allowed to participate in all of the youth activities and the sports and so on. It is their church, not just my parents or my grandparents, a sense of belonging. We wanted to have it as a secure spiritual home. Please note that, not just a secure home, a secure spiritual home. And by that, we mean each of our ministries would be life-giving and life-affirming. In a day and age where we live with, sadly, political polarization, we live with cynicism and skepticism, we said we will be the opposite. We will talk about the good news of the gospel. We will talk about what it means to walk with him and put your hand up and let him take your hand and know the thrill and joy of living the Christian life. And life-giving and life-affirming dominates our ministries, and it should. We also said that as a congregation, we want to be a place where people are learning and growing, never static in their faith, never backsliding, but doing the opposite, moving forward, maturing, persevering. We also said that it's important for us that we have a focus on developing intergenerational engagement and relational connectedness. Now, those are $35 words that basically say all ages and stages are welcome here. We want cross-fertilization between the nine-year-olds and the 90-year-olds. We want each person to have that sense of this is a place for them whatever circumstance, whatever age and stage, whatever background. And we also said as a priority, worship is not so much an activity, but a central part of our identity. It's who we are. We don't divorce ourselves from our worship. In fact, out of our worship comes mission. Out of our worship comes a sense of care for the community. Out of our worship comes growth and development and drawing closer to Christ. All of that is wrapped up in there. We also said as part and parcel of that, we want genuine engagement with the living God. We never simply want to go through the motions of worship. We don't want to be a people who pretend. We want vulnerability. We want accountability. We want transparency. 
we also said we are intentionally prepared and equipped for living out our faith. And that means from time to time, not every Sunday, will we deal with controversial issues of human sexuality or where does life begin or what is it that determines who I am. All of that we deal with on Sunday mornings. As I said, not every Sunday, but when we need to deal with it, we'll deal with it and we'll deal with it in a loving way gracious, life-affirming way, and we should. And then finally, we've said again and again and again, one of our main focal points would be transforming the spiritual heart of the city. And that means that when we welcome the overcomers who, as you know, are coming off of addiction to drug and alcohol into this place to worship with us on Sunday, when we financially support them week after week after week, when we are there for Hollis Academy, where 93% of the kids exist below the poverty level, we are saying we care we want to make a difference. We are going to say that transforming the spiritual heart of this city matters. I'm sure you heard in the announcements today that in a couple of weeks we have a buddy break. We don't draw much attention to it, but basically it is when families with special need children have no one to look after that child. That evening, mom and dad can drop off the child with special needs here at the church where we will have specially trained supervisors to look after the child and have everything available for them while mom and dad walks downtown Main Street and has a meal together. That's what it means in small ways to try to make a difference because we care and it comes out of our relationship with Christ because we know what it means to be exposed to his love. And we want others who are hurting and broken to know that love as well. Now, as I try and wrap all of this up, let me give you two more principles before I give you a conclusion. And one is a principle that we've touched on several times. It's by a very fine uh, academic writer, Daryl Gooder. And Gooder examines from a missional perspective the first century church and the 21st century church. And this is what he says. He says one is more or less passive, yielding to influences from the outside. The other is active, influencing rather than being influenced. The one looks to the past, the other to the future. The one is anxious, the other is prepared to take risks. The one guards boundaries, the other crosses them. That's us, gently, slowly, surely, being willing to persevere, willing to cross boundaries, willing to be the people of God in this place for a new generation to come and also for our current generation. In fact, let me finish with this. As a congregation, we exist in a culture which is dominated by interaction with a ubiquitous digital playground where meaning and purpose are determined by email, texts, smartphones, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. But we also have the spiritual discernment to understand that connectedness and intimacy of one's social media community of choice is for many a search for relational identity, purpose, and meaning. We exist to glorify God, enjoy Him forever, and to serve this community to the best of our ability. And over the last seven or eight years, we have come a long way. We have been able to achieve marvelous things. You saw just in the last 12 months, everything going on here at church. And I'm sure you're aware that we're running out of Sundays for baptism. We're now, we have a waiting list of 12. We're backed up till the end of June. And I heard my assistant on the phone the other day say this. Yes, uh-huh, of course. Yes, one of our pastors will be happy to talk to you about baptism. What age is the baby? Oh, the baby's not born yet. <laughs> and here was a young mom and dad planning the baptism to come. They were being proactive. They recognized the importance of baptism. Across the country, most Presbyterian churches bury more people than they baptize, and we are the opposite. We are in that wonderful situation 
of at the Ignite service on a Sunday morning, an average Sunday morning attendance when we were down in Fellowship Hall would be around 400, 450. It's now somewhere between 700 or 750. On Christmas Eve, we had 3,200 or so folks in attendance. I never thought I'd see those numbers again. And only three weeks ago on Easter Sunday, we had 3,600. We are growing. There's an energy. There's a, there's a vital sense of God at work in our midst. And this morning, you heard about our capital campaign. And as you came in, of course, you received a commitment card. And so, if you're saying, Richard, give me something practical to do as I go home this morning, it would be that. Prayerfully this week, ask yourself, can I participate in phase two? Father, show me the little I could do or the great deal I could do, but take it seriously. Respond to his call. It is time for us to finish this work. And the reason I'm saying this, to finish at least the financial portion of it, because I'm not sure with all of this growth and vitality that we're seeing, is this the climax of the last seven or eight years, or is it simply the beginning of what is yet to come? We are in an exciting place. It is not too much of a stretch to say that there are lessons to be learned from Pentecost in the first century, and may we, by the grace of God, be sensitive to the working and movement of His Holy Spirit today in order that we might be a church who is willing to transform the spiritual heart of the city. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for this passage of Scripture this morning. We thank you for your goodness and grace upon us and drawing us to study this morning Pentecost Sunday. And we would long that Pentecost would, in fact, be a reality of all that we are experiencing. Father, lead us, guide us, direct us. Continue to presence yourself in our midst. Grant to us a vision of what could be and help us as a congregation to step up, be willing to make a difference that we would become the people you're calling us to be. Father, bless us, please, we ask, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is one that you'll be very familiar with. It's an old favorite is probably the best way to describe it. But it's an old favorite for a number of reasons. It excites the heart. It enlivens the soul because we know the God we are singing about. Let's stand together and sing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
those, for those watching on our live stream broadcast, thank you for being with us. And we very much look forward to welcoming you at the same time next Sunday morning. For those of you here in the sanctuary, unfortunately, I have bad news for you because we're about to have a congregational meeting. And I know that Sunday morning, our habit and custom is that as soon as we have that final glorious hymn, we are out the door and off to lunch. However, this morning, we do need to hear your voice. And we need to hear your voice in this, because sacred to our Presbyterian system and our heritage is that you as a congregation have the right to call a pastor. In Scotland in this 18th century, we went to war over that issue. And congregations had the right and not the landowner and not the king to determine who your pastor was. And so that sec sacred uh, entity of the congregational voice being expressed is reflected in our, uh, our meeting this morning. I promise it will not take any more than about four and a half, five minutes. The folks downstairs are not impressed with me because I ran on a little. I was so excited about the Holy Spirit. So forgive me down there. Uh, but we will have have our congregational meeting and we'll have it as quickly as possible. So after the benediction, please be seated and we'll get things underway. So let me pray. And now may the blessing of God the Father, the Almighty, the eternal love of God the Son, and the peace and transforming presence of God the Holy Spirit rest upon us both now and always. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you for joining us this morning at First Presbyterian Church of Greenville. We hope you have a blessed week, and please join us again next Sunday. So I've kind of played